So thanks for thanks for coming, guys. Um, so so this is my first talk on uh, on ultrasound. Uh, ooh, you guys still see my screen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to get started, just a bit of background as to why we're having this talk uh, today. So I think as for, for us as renal registrars, our day-to-day decision-making is made quite closely um, with relation to ultrasound findings, be it decision to refer to urology, diagnose perifistular pseudoaneurysms, AV fistular stenosis, or decision to biopsy. Ultrasound is part and parcel of our decision-making. And I think as you know, over the past um, uh, um, five years, particularly um, as there's increasing interest in renal ultrasound uh, in, in ultrasound, uh, to the point where ultrasound is actually going to be incorporated in the junior doctor curriculum, I think it's good. Uh, I, mean, I think as renal registrars, we can't fall behind the pack, and I think it'd be good to actually uh, be more involved in ultrasound and incorporate it in our clinical work. So for that reason, uh, Sock, Alistair and I thought it would be useful to, to make this mini course, if you like, um, uh, uh, the, uh, so to basically talk about ultrasound, but mainly focusing on renal applications. So this, um, so this course, uh, so I'm very well aware that uh, there's a, a lot of you with a wide range of experience. So some of you guys with formal training, some without, but irregardless, I think as ultrasound usage grows, I suspect that um, a lot of our colleagues uh, out of Reno or within the hospital will have, I mean, there'll be more and more ultrasound talk in the workplace. And I think it would be useful that we all know the prescribed lingo that's been taught in the general ultrasound curriculum. Uh, so this, this way, you know, it ensures that everyone is in the same uh, sort of level uh, uh, when ultrasound usage uh, again grows. So I mean, the first aim, so my aims of this mini course really is to make sure that all of us are in the same uh, level when it comes to terminology and when it comes to techniques. Uh, and the second thing is also for us to be able to confidently perform an initial ultrasound assessment of a kidney for an acute referral or a novel patient, for example, when we get called onto AMU or it's a new patient that, um, uh, yeah, uh, that has been in the Queen Elizabeth uh, somewhere outside of renal, a different ward uh, with a pathology, uh, with a renal problem. Uh, and we don't have to wait for the next day or wait for someone else to do a, a, some formal ultrasound imaging before we make a more informed decision. And the last thing is to encourage us to use more ultrasound in day-to-day -day clinic work. Um, and I think the the way we're going to do this is in three parts. So first part is a, a firstly, it consists of three lectures which uh, will be delivered and all, the first of which I'm delivering right now. A second part and, and all these lectures will be given, uh, will be uh, presented by the end of this month. Uh, and after this month, I'll be asking each of you to go away and scan at least two kidneys per month. Ideally, one normal kidney and one abnormal one. And I'll be asking you guys to please save the image onto the ultrasound machine, and then we can discuss these images at the end of the month, uh, whenever you want to discuss them. Um, um, and so I think it's important to be able to save the images on the machine. I'll talk more about it later on. And every two months, or whenever we reach a critical number of interesting cases, I'll collate these cases uh, into a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll discuss them in a Zoom meeting, much like what we're doing now. So that will be the aim of the course. OK, so I think this is just a bit of a me slide. So this is just a bit of my experience with ultrasound. So first after ultrasound in 2016, and then I got a, a, a rope. Well, I and I got uh, went for the ultrasound course for intensive care. And the curriculum there is very focused mainly on abdomen as well as lung. And I got accredited back in 2018 and I got a logbook. And I think I'm, I'm only mentioning this just to say right from the beginning that I am no renal specialist, ultrasonographer or radiologist. Um, I think ICU people are fairly, uh, in a way, simple, like myself, very simple minded. And we look only at, and the curriculum that I've covered is only looking at general renal as well as kidney pathologies. 
Um, and so, um, you know, what that means is that out of my scope will be talking about very specialist niche things like AV fistula as well as transplant kidney as assessment. But um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, at least I'll be able to share my uh, some of my experience as well as my enthusiasm uh, in this. And if you can learn one or two things, that will really make me very happy. But and as this uh, course will evolve, we're going to get people to come and talk about uh, fistula assessments with ultrasound, Talking, uh, get people to come and talk about transplant uh, uh, assessment of transplant kidneys. So more on that hopefully later on as we evolve, uh, as this course evolves. OK, so um, enough of the preamble. So this is um, the curriculum that we're going to cover today. There's quite a lot to cover. Um, I'll be talking about first about uh, physics, talking about different probes, the medium, different knobs, what I call scanning 101, just the basic techniques, and then post-acoustic enhancement. Now, the aim is to try to finish this by 45 minutes. I think it's a bit ambitious. Uh, it might be that if we reach, uh, if we run out of time, I might just talk about um, uh, our safe you know, the bits that I haven't covered in the next slide. But I think it's important to go through the basics sort of comprehensively. OK, so with that with that said, oh, well, and actually one more slide. Um, so by the end of this hour, hopefully you'll be all these terms will mean something to you. OK, so. First slide is ultrasound. What is ultrasound? So ultrasound is basically a sound wave. That's essentially what it is, a sound wave of a particular frequency that is higher than the frequency that's uh, uh, um, that is uh, that allows us to detect. So as you can see here, audible frequencies, sound, uh, waves is much lower frequency, and ultrasound is in this section here, this part of the spectrum. And but essentially, it is a sound wave. That's essentially what it is. And obviously, and within ultrasound, you have a higher frequency ultrasound, and you also have the lower frequency ultrasound. And if you remember your physics from you know, A levels, high frequency basically means that you have more waves packed in a certain unit area. And what that, what that translates to is that it carries more, it has the ability to carry more data, the ability to carry and transmit more data. And, and it's for that very reason that your local radio music stations transmit the music with a higher frequency is so that you can it can transmit high clear high resolution music to your phone um so the first thing to 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 sort of remember is that high frequency means more data is, is transmitted which translates to a higher resolution or higher resolution uh, uh at the other end but uh, because a but higher frequency also means that it dissipates faster through a medium. Uh, I could think of it as like a massive candy floss uh, on a stick, and you try to chuck one with a lot with a lot of candy floss. And you try to chuck it, and it doesn't go that far. Whereas if you have a stick with less candy floss, uh, it doesn't have that much sort of surface area to block. Um, that much surface area. When you chuck it, uh, it can go a bit further. I kind of think of it like that. It's probably not the best analogy, but that's how it works in my mind. Essentially, what I mean to say is high frequency dissipates faster through the medium and transmits at a small, at a shorter distance. The converse obviously is true for low frequency. Uh, you, uh, it, it carries less data, has a lower resolution, but can travel further. And it's for that reason that it's used in emergency radios. Let's say, uh, and, and you can transmit emergency sort of radio transatlantic or across the world, let's say if an apocalypse happened, you use a low frequency radio. So um, the relevance of this, so I mean, so essentially what I want to sort of uh, highlight, high frequency, high resolution, but travels less. Low frequency, lower resolution, but travels further. And if you just remember that and then uh, for a second, and I'll come back to it. I just want to quickly, uh, in the next bit, I want to talk about different probes. 
So each of them will have uh, will obviously have a name. You'll be familiar with the first two, the linear probe. So Sony because it's a line, curve linear because it's a curve. And the one that we're less um, uh, 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 familiar with is a phase array probe. Um, so each has got a specific function uh, and we choose it because of the, the, the particular frequency uh, that it has. So the linear probe has a high frequency and the curvilinear probe has low frequency. We're going to forget about the phase array for now. I'll talk about it in a second. But let's just talk about the linear probe as well as the curvilinear probe. So again, I said the linear probe has got high frequency, uh, which means higher resolution. Uh, so if you look at the image on the left, so these are two images, left and right. These are the same plane. In fact, this is the plate. This is my left elbow, my antecubital fossa. This is my arm. And um, the one is the same plane, but a different probe. So the one on the left is a linear probe. The one on the right is a curvilinear probe. And I want you to take for a, sec a second to just appreciate the one, the blood vessel here in red on the left with a linear probe. You can see how clear the, the vessel walls are very distinct. And you can see that my muscle fascia here um, is also, you can see a very clear line, very clear wall. And you compare that with the curvilinear probe, which, I, which is high frequency, sorry, which is low frequency and therefore low resolution, you can see it's a very grainy image. Uh, so the, the, again, my blood vessel here, you compare that with here, the wall is a lot, much grainier and not clear. And here, the green bit, which is my muscle, you can't even appreciate the muscle fascia. So which, mean, which means that the linear probe, you know, is, which means the curvilinear probe is not ideal for very fine procedures like venous cannulation or, you know, when we uh, obviously uh, when we put our vas caths in trying to 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 visualize the needle tip um, uh, of curvilinear obviously um, is it's bad for it. You can't. It's difficult to make 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 the the uh, fine images or fine structures. But this picture also demonstrates the advantage of curvilinear in that there's a higher depth. Um, uh, a higher depth. So you can see here, um, the linear probe only allows me to go a couple of centimeters, and then that's it. That's the end of the image. Whereas here, the curvilinear, as I said, low resolution travels further, allows me to get a, a, a deeper depth. And you can see all the way to my bone. I think this is my radius bone, I think. But anyway, so it allows you to have a lower, uh, much, uh, the curvilinear allows you to penetrate to a much deeper surface. Okay, so, um, Let's talk about the phase array. The phase array essentially is a low frequency probe, much like the curvilinear. The advantage of it, however, is that it is small. And this image, I took this image online for a purpose uh, because it very nicely demonstrates that the phase array emits frequencies, emits the ultrasound through a pinhole. Uh, and because of its small probe and a small emission window, it allows it to see through small gaps, such as between your ribs. And it's for that reason that your phase array probes is used in echocardiograms. As you can see here, it can peep through the ribs, and because of its low frequency, it can penetrate all the way through your chest to assess the full length of your heart. And here you can see a beautiful four-chamber view of your heart. Okay, the four-chamber, so that but you know, phase, phase array, we, we use less, but I think it's good to know what it is. Uh, so in the future, when you meet the out, uh, when, you, uh, uh, when you're in different departments and they have the different ultrasound probes, you know what it's for. Okay, so that, those are probes. So that's probe and frequency. And then I want to talk about conduction, the conduction medium. Now, as I said before, ultrasound is just a sound. And like any sound, you need a, a, a medium in order to conduct your sound. Much like if you go to space, where it's vacuum, there's no medium, you can't transmit sound. For ultrasound, water is just the right density for ultrasound to be transmitted the best. And water is better than air because air is 
too the density is too small is too is is not dense enough. So whenever it so that's why you know that's why you know we we know that jelly is very useful. Uh, we need the jelly in order to to conduct ultrasound, and uh, it's always a joke that you know jelly is the man's best friend. If you have a poor image, use more jelly. You're never wrong to use more jelly. However, if your structure is too dense, like for example a bone, then instead of conducting ultrasound through, it reflects, it blocks ultrasound and doesn't allow ultrasound through. Uh, and this, and then this is demonstrated by this picture here. This is actually, I think this is my lung. Uh, I, no, sorry, no, actually this is not my lung. That one's later on. Uh, so basically, this is a lung uh, ultrasound. You can see these two structures here is the bone, and bone is very dense, and so it blocks the ultrasound from passing through. So it appears as black. Whereas here, you see your lung is able to transmit ultrasound through, and you can still get an image. I'll talk more about this in a second, but essentially, talking essentially, I just wanted to mention that the medium is also very important to consider when you are looking at your image. So now I would like to talk about probe physics. So how does the ultrasound get translated into a picture on your screen? So here is my, uh, 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 my drawing of a probe on the left. And here is my screen. This is a screen where your image gets projected upon. And the probe has got two bits to it, a part that emits ultrasound and another part that receives the ultrasound. It's a very complex, uh, it's a very complex technology. And in fact, the probe is the most expensive bit. If you want to steal an ultrasound, uh, something from the ultrasound, you steal the probe. Essentially, and, the, and basically the receiver part talks to the screen. And I want to demonstrate two parts in this section here. So first, I want to talk about um, uh, uh, talk about this. So your probe emits ultrasound, and at every level, a small portion of that ultrasound is being reflected back. At every level, this is just one level that I've drawn. But at every level, this happens. Uh, so a small portion, represented by the thin line here, is reflected back. And the receiver detects the, the wave that is reflected back and also detects the intensity or the amount of ultrasound that's been reflected back from that level. And depending on the intensity that it detects, it assigns a shade of gray on your screen and projects it on your screen. So if if you look at this picture here, you have more ultrasound that's reflected back and your receiver reflect, uh, receives a higher uh, uh, intensity of ultrasound. Then it, the, compute, the, the, ultra, the machine will assign a lighter or whiter shade of grey on your screen. So the more ultrasound that, that it detects, the whiter the image on your screen. And we call that hyper echoic. So because it detects more echoes, more sound that's been echoed back from your surface. So again, the whiter the screen, the more hyper, the whiter the bit of the image, the more hyper echoic, the darker, the more hypo echoic. So that's the first thing, the intensity of, of the, the, the wave that's been detected is important. The second thing that I want to demonstrate is this, is, is this. So the receiver also detects the amount of time that the wave takes to come back from being emitted. So for example, this wave here takes an amount of time, which I put as T, to be detected by the receiver. And depending on that amount of time that it is, is left and come back, the machine did will assign it a depth on your screen, a certain depth. So if you have another, uh, uh, um, uh, if you have a, another ultrasound, another wave that takes that went twice the depth, 
it will take twice the amount of time to come back. The machine detects that it takes longer to come back and will think that that surface that it's been reflected back from is deeper and will assign it a, deep, a deeper depth. This is important to understand artifacts that uh, are of ultrasound um, uh, that you will come across. Now, um, I'm, I'm just, I didn't put, I didn't want to talk about artifacts during this uh, lecture because I think it's a bit too much to cover, but I just want you guys to just remember these two concepts um, about the physics because I'll touch on it later on and it's important to know so that you can understand the image that's in, uh, in front of you next time. So we'll skip artifacts and then we're going to talk about nobology. Now at any point in time, if you guys have any questions, please pause and uh, and ask. I cannot see any of your faces because all I can see is my presentation screen, so please unmute and just interrupt me. So, nobology, we're going to talk about the different knobs that you can use on your ultrasound that will help you. Okay, there's three different, part, uh, three different knobs that you can play with. So first is gain, and on our machine, it looks, uh, it's this F3 knob, and it's labeled very helpfully there. Now, I encourage you to touch this knob every time that you get an image. To twiddle it back and forth, uh, you never, uh, to try to optimize your image each time that you have a, 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 an image. So basically what a gain is, is, um, is your brightness and contrast of your image. When you increase your gain, you increase the brightness of your image and vice versa. And it's very helpful. And this is, and to give you an example, this is my kidney that I scanned a couple of weeks ago. And you can see here that you can't really appreciate. You can appreciate that there's a structure, but this image is too dark. And therefore you want a more gain. So you twiddle the knob and then, hey, -ho, you can get a much more defined image. You can see my pyramids, you can see my, my cortex, my medulla, and you can even see my fascia. So by twiddling, playing with the gain, you can optimize your image. You will be able to optimize your image um, uh, better. There comes a point when you have too much gain. Again, same, this is my kidney, and I twiddle, and I put too much gain, and you see just, just a, a white out. You can't appreciate the structures uh, um, as clearly as the previous image. So it's important to know gain, um, uh, to play with the gain, and a goal, one easy way of knowing that you're roughly in the right gain uh, is that any structure that has got fluid in it should appear black. Like these blood vessels here, they should appear black. If they look like this, that means you've got too much gain. So that's one way of helping you decide whether you've got enough gain. Okay, so that's that knob. And here, uh, I will need some audience participation. It's a wall of shame. And I got this, got these images from a website called ultrasoundidiots.com, for real. Um, there's actually a website uh, that exists that I took this image from. And can someone tell me what is, what is wrong with these three images? Sorry, four images, anyone. So you have your kidney, your bladder, your blood vessel. Anybody? Nobody? Sorry? You're quite soft, Mahmoud. Maximum depth? Yes. Too much depth. So in all these pictures, you have way too much depth. And there is, um, and um, you can see that when you have too much depth, um, it really affects the quality of your image. What I forgot to mention earlier on is that um, with your gain, when you increase and decrease your gain, it only does some post-processing of your image. Like Much like when you go on Instagram, you have a picture and you want to increase and decrease your brightness, it doesn't improve the resolution of your image. It only, it only does some post-processing of it. 
makes the image look a bit prettier, but it doesn't improve the resolution. How to, when you have too much depth, uh, well, to, in order to optimize your resolution, you do that by optimizing your depth. So, the knob that controls the depth is F2 on our machine. And I will encourage you to make sure that your structure of interest encroaches or covers the bottom half of your screen. That's what I was taught. So it should occupy most of your screen. Um, and the advantage of this is because if I go back to this image, if you have too much depth, your ultrasound is emitting and spreading all the ultrasound and sampling all these structures which you don't need. So it's spreading its ultrasound to, into too wide an area. You want to concentrate, you want to reduce that depth so that all the ultrasound can be concentrated on just the structures that you're in. And again, more ultrasound in one area means that you can get more data back. I hope that makes sense. So i give you an example. So this is again my kidney. And uh, same plane, different depth. You can see here when you have, when I've, when I've maximized the depth, my kidney not only looks smaller on the screen, but also if you look at the fascia, if you look at the fascia, uh, it's much grainier than this, where I've dropped the depth and made it occupy the second, the bottom half, or as much of the screen as I can. You can see that the fascia is much more defined, uh, even despite it being a curvilinear probe. Um, and you can see my cortices as well as my structures a lot clearer. The resolution is a lot better because there's more ultrasound that's sampling the area and the ultrasound is not being spread over useless bits. So the important thing is to make sure you fill your vessel, sorry, fill your screen with the structure of interest, be the vessels, a blood vessel, a kidney or a bladder, doesn't matter. Okay. So the next bit then is color Doppler. Okay, color Doppler will be very useful. This is a a uh, picture of my uh, right internal jugular as well as my carotid. So and when I add Doppler, this is the kind of image that I get. Now, the, uh, what does this color actually mean? Well, basically the color will tell you the direction of the fluid that's moving in relation to your probe. And I'll tell you, and I'll touch, uh, I'll go into more detail. Basically, a color Doppler will be able to tell you if there is any moving fluid in your area of interest. And the color, whether it's red or blue, will tell you which direction it is going. Now, before I talk about what color means what, um, it's important to say that you have to angle your probe at, a, at 45 degrees to your blood vessel in order to get an accurate representation of the color. So what I mean is that this is exam, imagine, imagine this is your blood vessel, cut through your blood vessel. Your probe has to be angled at 45 degrees to the perpendicular, to, sorry, to the plane. Now, and if you have fluid, and once, you, once you've done that, any fluid that's flowing in this direction, so away from your probe, will look blue. Any fluid that's moving towards your probe will look red. Basically, that's what the colors mean. Blue away from probe, red towards your probe. The way to remember this is remembering Bart, Bart Simpson, Bart, blue away, red toward. So, Bart is, um, uh, 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 and basically this picture also just um, represents that. So, when the flu is moving away from the probe, you get a blue color. Towards your probe, you get a red color. Oh, that's clear. So, if you look, so go back to my image here. Keeping in mind that vein, your venous blood goes down, 
and your venous and uh, your uh, arterial blood goes up the opposite direction, you can more or less tell whether my probe is pointing, whether it's pointing towards my head, or whether it's pointing towards my foot. Now, obviously, with the, if the venous blood is coming down and it's red, it means that it's coming towards the probe. So that will immediately tell you that my probe was pointed up towards my head. And the arterial blood obviously is going the other direction, away from the probe, and that's why it looks blue here. So that's color Doppler, and I hope that's clear. Um, okay, so that is Doppler in a nutshell. I hope that you're still with me. Um, the next bit we're going to talk about then is orientation of your probe. How do you put your probe on the patient? There is a protocol in which you orientate your probe. So on your probe, you notice that there are little grooves or orientation markers. It might look like a little bump. It might look like a little groove or a green sticker. But essentially, this will correspond to your left-hand side of the screen. Any structure that's closer to this marker will go towards the left-hand side of the screen. And by protocol, that marker should face either to the right of the patient or to the head of the patient, as represented in this diagram. And, and it's important to know this because it is important to do this, particularly if you're saving images in the future or if you're uploading images in the future to social media. Everyone is, will be trained to know that the left side of the screen corresponds to either the right side of the patient or the head of the patient. So for example, this liver ultrasound, I know immediately that this side of the screen is towards the right of the patient. Any structure on here, any abnormality will correspond to the left. It's to the left of the patient. And here, I will immediately know whether that the left side of the screen is towards the patient's head. The patient's head. Uh, and it's important to get this right because in the future, when you, you know, when you're talking to your colleagues or again to the learned audience, a learned audience in social media, they will be expecting this orientation. And if you don't do this, it really throws people off. So that's an important thing about the probe orientation. And now again, some audience participation, please. Um, what is wrong with these four images? Can someone shout out an answer? Anyone? Should um, the person's hand be on, on like planted on the patient? Perfect. Yes, exactly. So these, this is this is me, of course. Um, examples of what I call floaty hands, uh, and the problem with this is that when you have your hand, when you don't anchor your hand on the skin, and you look away onto the screen, your hand will start doing its own thing, and you have what we call what I like to call a migrating image where the screen will start or the image on your screen will start drifting to one side by itself. So the important thing and why a lot of people sometimes find cannulation difficult or, 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 or you know, trying to maintain an image difficult is because they do not anchor on the, their hands on the screen. And it's surprising how many people don't actually anchor themselves, actually do this all the time. You see consultants in a &E that do this and it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not good. Don't be that guy. Um, and these are different examples where you can anchor yourself on the screen depending on the context or position that you're in. Um, and this will, this will help you a lot when it comes to um, having a stable image and a better quality image in the future. So that's grip. Um, and now we're going to quickly talk about the different scanning techniques. And it's important to know what these terms are because these are terms that all sonographers will be using in the future. And in, whether you're being supervised by a sonographer in the future or whether you're supervising someone else in the future, it's important that you use the same terms. So first, this is what we call painting. So you, you, your probe is here and you just go up and down. That's called painting. Or you call it skiing. 
where you go in the direction of your orientation marker. This is rotating. I think everyone knows this. And you get a longitudinal to cross section. And you can see here that's my vein. It goes from longitudinal to a cross section, so rotating. Fanning, again, this is very important in the future when it comes to renal ultrasounding as well as bladder ultrasounding. Fanning, so your probe remains where it is, and then you just move the tail back and forth with the probe stuck in the same spot. And rocking, I, I forgot to do one for rocking, but essentially, as this picture shows, if your probe is like this and it's on the skin, this is fanning, that is rocking. This also is very important when it comes to scanning the kidneys or the bladder in the future. Okay. So those are the ultrasound techniques, um, uh, and I will be using that uh, as we go along over the next couple of months, these terms. I was going to have a slide about how to save patients' details, but I think I'll skip this and I'll and I'll show how to do this on the demonstration um, uh, uh, lecture uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Also, I was going to talk about freezing your image, and there's a freeze button which basically does what it says on the tin. And this is very important when it comes to um, to it's important to use when you want to to measure your kidneys or measure your your um, your bladder. And I'll talk about that again more during the demonstration. Now, the last bits. What time are we on? Good. OK, the last bit I want to talk about. Uh, important concept, post-acoustic enhancement or shadowing. Uh, and it's important to recognize what these are because it will help you differentiate between fluid as well as solid structures in your ultrasound image. Fluid can be abscess, cis hematoma, your zudates, solid, bone tumor stones. And what and I'm going to try demonstrate this um, with these with this image that I've drawn. So this is your probe uh, on your skin and the arrows represent your ultrasound. The ultrasound waves. Uh, and at every level you lose a bit of ultrasound waves because it gets scattered or gets reflected away. You lose a bit. So uh, so at every level you get you get increasingly less ultrasound going through. Now, what if you have a fluid, um, a, a, fl a structure with fluid in there, uh, represented by the blue? As I said before, fluid is a best conductor of ultrasound. So, if you have a fluid in this second level, instead of scattering the ultrasound waves, it actually conducts all the waves, or most of the waves, through, such that when you reach down to the next level, the bottom here, the ultrasound waves are preserved and not scattered. You get more ultrasound going through to the deeper levels, just underneath that fluid field structure, compared to the neighboring, stru the neighboring structures, which have less ultrasound going through. What that means is that more ultrasound going through and more ultrasound being reflect, being detected by your, by your probe. And as I said before, more ultrasound coming back means that it looks brighter, more hyperechoic, more echoes going back. So it will look brighter. And then you get something like this. So this is your blood vessel. And then you hear, have here a very bright tail. This is called post-acoustic enhancement. And it tells you that there is a fluid filled structure just above that tail. A post acute enhancement. Now, the converse is true for a solid structure that's too dense. So, here in brown, for example, you have a very solid structure such as a bone, which prevents ultrasound from going through. So, underneath the bone, you have no ultrasound going through compared or much less ultrasound going through compared to the neighboring sort of structures. And what happens when you have no ultrasound going through, the opposite of hyperechoic, you get hypoechoic. The, the, the ultrasound doesn't detect any waves coming back and it will just look black. And then you get here, for example, this is a bone. You get this black stuff, which, sorry, a black trail, which is called post-acoustic shadowing. 
And this is very important concept to, to, to understand because um, as I'll demonstrate in the next few slides, uh, what post acute enhancement and shadowing is. And so again, a bit of audience participation. Uh, you guys can, can someone tell me on this picture what this structure is? Is it solid or is this liquid in there and why? So this is a kidney. Can someone shout out what do you think this is? Solid or liquid? Anybody? Nobody? The liquid. And because? Because it's got a uh, uh, hyperacoustic hyper shadow, shadow under it. Absolutely. So you can see this little tail here. That's your, so this is a, a fluid filled structure. Keep in, uh, yeah, fluid filled structure. And can someone tell me what this is over here? So this is a kidney. You have someone that comes in with kidney pain. You don't know whether it's renal artery stenosis, renal vein thrombosis, or is it something else? And then you get put an ultrasound probe on and you see these structures. Can someone tell me what these are and why? This is a kidney. Are they stones? Why do you think they're stones? I don't know because there's a black shadow under, under them. Yeah, well, it, it, you're absolutely right. Oh, it's stones and so stone is very dense and it doesn't allow any ultrasound to go through it. And so you get these shadowing behind it. And so you're absolutely right. This, these are stones. And let me skip to this picture here. Can someone tell me what this is? I'll tell you that this is a bladder. Oh, oops. But what is this? Anyone? Is that something solid, solid, solid on the outside, outside the uh, uh, center? You mean this one? Yeah. Well, yes. 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 So first, OK, so yes, yeah, so it is something solid. And why do you think, why do you say it's solid? Um, because of the sort of lack of signal beyond it, but it looks like there's maybe a, a tail of some sort of in, uh, signal coming back middle, so that's why I wonder if there's maybe some liquid in the middle of that. Object. Ah, I see. You mean, you mean, you, you mean this bright bit here? Is that what you're saying? Why do you think there's liquid coming back? Liquid in the center? No, it was kind of just like below that, down the middle of the object, but I'm, I'm maybe barking up the wrong tree. Oh, no, I think you're absolutely right. So the bladder and by first principles, we know that there's something solid. This is something solid because of the shadow. And the question is, if it's and and this and this is a stone. This is a stone and and you we are. And I guess the question is uh, also is why is it that we only see the top part of the stone? Why can't we appreciate the whole stone uh, on this image? And the reason for that is because the top part of the stone, I mean, the whole stone is dense, and the top part of it prevents any ultrasound from going through. So all ultrasound at this level is being reflected back, all of it, which is why it looks so bright, because all the ultrasound is going back, and none of it is coming through. So you only see the top of the, the stone, which looks very bright, because all the ultrasounds are being reflected from that level, and nothing below it. Now, I don't think there's anything underneath here that you uh, can appreciate, but it's probably the quality of the image of this picture that I've taken. But you're absolutely right. This is a stone. And again here, as I said, it's a bladder. It's a fluid-filled space. So right next to it, you can see there's a post-acoustic enhancement compared to the rest of the pelvis structures here. So normal pelvic structure, post-acoustic enhancement behind the bladder, and just behind the stone, you get post-acoustic shadowing. Yeah. And now can someone tell me what this one here is, the one on the left? This is a kidney. But what is this? Anyone?
Is it a cyst? Why do you think it's a cyst? Um, so it's fluid filled because there's the hyperechoic area underneath. Um, it's fairly kind of weed, well demarcated and it's coming off the top pole of the kidney. So, yeah. Absolutely. So hyperechoic, so post-acoustic enhancement. So it's, there's post-acoustic enhancement uh, behind this structure. And you're absolutely right. This is a uh, simple, this is a, a big renal cyst. And here um, is um, obviously a, a, a liver. And again, you can see a post-acoustic enhancement below it, which means it's a fluid filled space. But interestingly, in this picture, there's these little structures here, which I don't know what these are, but it's something that, you know, uh, you can appreciate when you put an ultrasound in. It might be stranding, it might be a more complex a uh, 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 fluid filled space, I'm not sure, but you know, still interesting to see. And the one over here on the right, this is a kid, this is a liver, and you can see here, this is a quite a complex structure that seems to be of the same intensity, the same sort of shade as the rest of your liver. And that's because this is a tumor, and tumors made of obviously livers, in this case, you know, similar liver uh, sort of similar body tissue in here in this case probably liver uh, liver cells and so therefore this abnormal tissue mass will probably have the same um, uh, 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 amount of uh, the same density as the rest of the liver so it looks the same density as the rest of the liver but we, around it you can see that there is this uh, probably uh, malignant uh, effusion around it. So there's fluid around it, which is why, very subtle in this picture, but you can see there's a bit of a post-acoustic enhancement underneath it. You compare it to this section, you can see there's post-acoustic enhancement there. So, yeah, with ultrasound, you can, you, you'll be able to see all these, uh, all these abnormalities. And, okay, so I'm ending off now. Um, so this is post-acoustic enhancement and post-acoustic shadowing. And we talked about a cyst and the, the fact that and we talked about cyst and now we're going to go to this image and this is actually an image that I scanned uh, in 4D for one of our patients that came in in Christmas and I tell you that this is a this is a TCVC on the left hand side and she came in with pain over a TCVC. Now can someone tell me what is going on in this picture? And why do you think so? Anyone? So there's a fluid filled collection above the TCVC site. So okay. you've got your kind of high acoustic shadowing below that fluid filled bit. And then there's the dark shadowing under the bottom of the TCVC because it's the plastic in the lumen. So it won't reflect the light through it because you won't get the fluid. Yeah. So post acoustic shadowing and post acoustic enhancement. And uh, as compared, you can see, compare that with the rest with the tissue here on the side. So you're absolutely right, Emma. And the thing that I want to point out in the point of this slide is if you look at this fluid filled space, you can see there's spe little speckles here. If you compare that with this image here or this image here, where it is just very uniform blackness, this is not a uniform black. It is not a uniform black space. It's what we call a heterogeneous collection as opposed to a homogeneous collection. So the learning point from this particular slide is to say, to look out when you see a fluid filled space, to look out for the homogeneous, for the heterogeneity of, to look at whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. If it's heterogeneous, it tells you that it's either blood or pus that's inside there. It's a very complex fluid that's inside. So to look out for the heterogeneity of that fluid filled space. So uh, let's see what time it is. OK, we have a good time. That is actually the end of my talk here. And this slide, um, again, 
should was the first the slide that I showed in uh, show you guys in the beginning, and all these terms should at least mean something to you um, now. And uh, it's important to try to use the the lingo, you know, post acoustic enhancement, post acoustic shadowing, hyperechoic, hypoechoic, um, as much as possible, just to get used to the lingo. Um, uh, I'll talk about. We do have time. Yeah, just got enough time to. So I, I think it's important to say that um, ultrasound. Uh, I love ultrasound. And if you, you know, uh, any excuse to use an ultrasound, I will do. But there is important to. But I will. But I'll be the first one that will say that ultrasound has got its own limitations. It's good to do as a point of care, but ultimately, um, we our machines may not be as advanced as a sonographer as a radiologist machine and our expertise inherently are not going to be as advanced as uh, as the radiologists and you know in in the end of the day there are some modalities of imaging that will of course trump ultrasound so i always i always have a low threshold to say i don't know there's not enough information i can get from this ultrasound i need more formal imaging or more need, need a more detailed scan have a low, so you know. I have a low. You know, it's important to to know the limitations of ultrasound. It should only be used as an adjunct to your decision making, um, and unless it's very obvious, unless you're very confident, you know, you can make um, quite um, uh, you can make big decisions based on it. But I will always err towards getting someone who's more specialized or getting a more specialized scan. So it's important to talk about the limitations of ultrasound. So that is the end of my lecture. I uh, hope that it makes sense and I hope I didn't speak too fast. And I know my janky images, hopefully, and janky drawings, hopefully I had demonstrated um, things semi-clearly to you. In the next lecture in two weeks time, we'll be focused more on kidney pathologies as well as bladder pathologies. So less of the dry stuff, and we'll be talking more about, you know, interesting pathologies. So um, hopefully the next lecture will be a bit more interesting. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm going to stop. Well, I will um, I'll keep it for now. Um, is there any questions that you guys have? Um, no, just say thanks very much, Sai. That was excellent. And uh, I don't know if you can see it because you've got your screen up, but you're getting quite a lot of applause. Oh, am I? Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Um, hopefully that was helpful. I did spend a lot of time drawing and trying to find images and scanning myself. So hopefully this this is um, this was helpful to you. Uh, hi, Sai. Socrates. Hey, hi, Sai. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it was very useful as well. Very nice. Well done. Uh, especially the part with the acoustic shadowing and acoustic enhancement, I think, is um, I find that the most useful. So it, it gives a clear idea of what's happening in the background. Yeah. Uh, so just to remind everyone, the next session is going to be in on the 21st of April, so not the following Wednesday, so almost two weeks time at the same time. Um, and then we can move on to the live demonstration and then get some practice in the, in the machines. Uh, and um, yeah, thanks very much, Sal. Thank you very much. Is there, if there's no other questions, shall we end the session? Thank you, Sal. That was really good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sal. Thanks, thanks for, 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 for.